Hey, everybody, it's Devin. Yeah. And the girl who's never seen <laughs> Halloween Town. I'm sorry, okay? Welcome to Med Crimes. <laughs> If you're watching on YouTube, you will see the aggression with which Devin just welcome to med crimes into the so microphone. We were just trying to come up with a mythical creature for our new <sighs> Patreon, which we will announce in a moment. And while we were brainstorming, I came up with our current mythical creature. And then it came out that Kate does not know who this is. And because now I'm I need not... to take a poll. Listen. I'm sorry. So let's announce our Patreon. Our Patreon is Mara FM. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, and we Mara. love you. Hi, and Mara. Mara, your mythical creature is Benny, the skeleton taxi driver from Halloween Town. I have to confess. It is October 29th. It is almost <laughs> spooky day. And the queen of spook over here has never seen Halloween Town. I apologize. What Somehow... was your childhood like? I mean, it was. I gotta it was talk to Mama fanta- D. I, no. I should have asked her Listen, today. It was fantastic. I had a great childhood. <laughs> Somehow this one flew <laughs> under the radar, and I'm really sorry. I'm spent. I don't understand. Okay. Well, I wish I knew this before when I saw your mother earlier today. I feel like one of the pillars of our friendship has just been ripped out from underneath <laughs> us, and like we need to rebuild now. I am no longer stable. This is. <laughs> we are. We are on very thin ice over here as a unit. It's very sad. So shocking hole. Who else has not seen Halloween Town? Please tell me that there is a critter out there who has not seen Halloween Town with me. That would be great. Um, welcome everyone. It Bam. is almost Halloween. Ooh. Ooh. Nice. All of our children are together. So if you hear some thuds. There's some pitter pattering happening. We have some pitter pattering. It's I mean, it's actually really beautiful because our kids are so cute together. They are cute together. And my oldest just turned nine. We had the her comfort, birthday party today. The comfort that our children have around each other and us, i.e. my youngest just went into your freezer. I was and just going to say. And I said, how did you get that? And you go, I went and got it by myself. So I said, this is a, all I ever wanted in life was for your my family <laughs> and your children to be comfortable enough in my home mm-hmm. to go in the freezer and grab a fucking popsicle. That's living the dream. I I Cheers. feel like I've I've absolutely reached. reached my goal. Goals reached. We have wine today. So if the anybody goal for me is that your child is now old enough to babysit my children. Yeah. So I'm paying her five <laughs> bucks to watch the boys upstairs. It's it's this is going great. I love this for us. It's awesome because yep. I also just bought her a fantastic Lego set oh for her birthday. Oh my god, she's already ripped it open and is she going is to town putting on together it. right now. She loves Harry Potter. It's a whole situation. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. So we have quite the doozy today. Devon! Um, it's a Devonism. It's a Devonism. It's a Devonism. Oh, surprise! If you say it three times, is that it like makes it real. Beetlejuice. Yes. Beetlejuice. Do I say it? Yeah. Beetlejuice. Ah, he's right there. Oh. Just kidding. <laughs> I was looking around <laughs> hoping he would show up. Yeah. I'd really make this day very interesting. So what we're about to talk about today, I want to preface in case I don't say it enough during the episode. Okay. So everything here is alleged. 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 Okay. We have not gone to trial. We've had a congressional hearing, and there, but there's still lots of investigations from the Office of Inspector General. Okay. okay. Nothing has been it is just, soon. We need to talk about it because it's out there right now and it's a it's pretty heavy. And because fuck. It's and because crazy. this would probably just be again found to be true if found to be true, the med crime of all med crimes. Wow. I mean, it's literally everybody's worst nightmare. I I know the headline, but I've not d- dived into it because I knew you were doing an episode. And I, I would just like to say, to hear. who has ever had the fear of waking up on an operating room table while they're doing surgery on you, right? Literally me. There is that fear. I've had that now, literal fear. Now, let's say waking up when they're about to harvest your organs because they believe you to be dead. I feel like how many balls have had to have been dropped to get to this point? Right. I mean... Huge. So balls. we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna talk about it. Like I said, right now, a lot of my research, I don't have court documents. Mm-hmm. I don't have because things right. aren't released yet. Okay. So, so it's media outlets. I had to I listened to a podcast. I 
that had two of the that had the two whistleblowers mm -hmm. um in their sides and again what they're allowed to talk about because mm -hmm. certain things because legal proceedings are still underway investigations are still underway they couldn't talk about everything right um so some of the stuff right now is hearsay sure. so we're basically just going to have a discussion on it it's mm -hmm. not it's not completely foolproof right yet um but it's very important to talk about because it's just it's kind of it's kind of bringing on a whole new light into something that we didn't know was an issue yes right um yeah. to something that you thought was miraculous and saving lives mm -hmm. but what really goes on a little bit yeah so it makes it pretty concerning um so i've titled it organ donation nightmare oh god because that's pretty much what it is okay some I'm, of you go ahead sorry i'm just um we do a lot of cases where we're like it ends in this holy shit moment. Mm -hmm. And it's like the amount of astronomical failures that have to happen in rapid succession in order to get to that point. Mm -hmm. It's like mind boggling that it happens. But this this shit happens. Right. Like these sentinel events happen. There's like, misdiagnoses. Think about, there's yeah. whatever. But think about like Nathan Sutherland and the and the. um the victim that he raped and impregnated and nobody realized she was right. pregnant until, until yeah i mean it, a comatose it's along those lines. is an agonizing pain exactly exactly so it's just you know one yeah. of those times so like i said i don't have all sides mm -hmm. um because really the only ones that are talking right now are the whistleblowers mm -hmm. um the association uh that's talked about in here that does release a statement which i'm going to read so just bear with me like if it seems biased because right now it kind of is because we haven't gone through the legal have. stuff. Right. Yes. So it's just bringing it to light because it's being talked about out there. Mm -hmm. And for, you know, two gals like us to just who to form shoot our the own shit opinions in the and whatever and shoot the shit in the basement today. This is what we're shooting. This the is shit what about. we're shooting the shit. And, and there's maybe, still so many questions. Well, that's the thing. And then maybe season four, we can do an update episode. And then the be time some... comes when they've when they've closed it, when we when things have happened, yeah, you know, when there's knows? a trial ongoing, maybe we will have more. So um, the the patient, the the person that is involved is Anthony Thomas Hoover, also known by TJ. They call him TJ. Today, he is alive and well. And he is currently being cared for by his sister. Oh, my God. OK. It's, so he lived through. He survived. So all he, of this. he is currently being his sister is his legal guardian. He has some disabilities, okay. um, but he is alive. Wow. And when we post this, you will be e easily able to find photos of him mm. where you can tell that he is doing just fine. OK. Um, he's currently being cared for by his sister after potentially having had a drug overdose and suffering anoxic brain damage. Wow from that uh, we will discuss a little bit about the drug overdose in this episode um but we're about to really just kind of dive into the heartbreaking and alarming story as okay. to what happened to him i'm so ready again i kind of have this here in the in the paragraph just to not forget but i've already stated it it's important to state again in case i don't use the alleged. word enough alleged everything is alleged yes all right i cannot stress it enough it's alleged, everybody. In September, um, a, a congressional hearing was held, but multiple investigations are still going on and nothing's been concrete. Okay. <clears throat> Donna Rohr of Richmond, Kentucky, is TJ's sister. Okay. TJ is um, her 36-year-old brother, um, and he was the patient. He was rushed to the hospital in October of 2021 mm -hmm. because of a quote-unquote drug overdose. Okay. His sister recounts um, how his brother, how her brother was taken to the to Baptist Health Hospital in Richmond, Kentucky. They felt that um, she felt that when he was found, he was um, pretty quickly. They were kind of told about his grim diagnosis. OK, right. Pretty fast. And they were asked to change his code status to a DNR okay. again rather quickly. Mm -hmm. Um. The family was so shocked and taken by all of this that they're like, we need to hold on a little bit. Like, let's just wait. 24 hours go by. Then they make the decision to change him to a DNR. Okay, that's okay? fair. But he's still alive. Sure. But a day goes by. Let's see what tests are showing. Okay. They make him a DNR. Then the doctor soon told her and her other relatives that he lacked any reflexes of, or brain activity. And they ultimately decided to remove him from life support after being given the brain death diagnosis. Oh. That is so, so he sad. was diagnosed as 
brain being dead. brain dead. Yes. He, so he also had... suffered cardiac arrest for 35 minutes. Okay. So he, so he, <laughs> they're presuming then he's had a loss of brain function from Correct. the cardiac arrest and he has no reflexes. He's Correct. got no brain activity on the monitor. Um, so <clears throat> the staff then did tell him after they were making the decision that they were going to remove him, you know, that ultimately they would be looking at removing him from life support. The Baptist staff reportedly told his sister, Donna, that um, TJ had given permission for his organs to be donated in the event of his death and that his name showed up on the organ donor registry. Okay. So for those of us that do not know, we're going to, again, talk about it a little bit towards the end, but it's not just a picture on our license. There is a registry. Oh, there's a whole thing. If you check that box, there's there's a You're registry, on the registry and our name is there. Yep. And so to honor his wishes... Um, the hospital tested which of his organs would be bio- viable for donation. Mm-hmm. This also included a cardiac catheterization. Oh, um, wow. And the family proceeded with it. Um, his sister stated that she kind of became came became concerned when um, he was doing the honor walk. So I'm going to oh. talk about his honor walk a little bit a couple of times. But um, she first became concerned with his condition when she said it didn't seem right. She's like, he opened his eyes during the honor walk and she's like, he he was looking around. Wait, what? As he was going from the intensive care unit to the operating room again during okay. the honor walk. And for those that don't know what the honor walk is, is if you have a patient who's what? about to become an organ donor and save multiple lives as a result of losing their own. Staff will come into the hallway. We'll line up, do a very silent honor of this patient as they're from their ICU by. room mm-hmm. to the OR as they're going by in a way to honor the person who's about to save many others. So, and I'm sure that there's a level of expected sort of involuntary movement Correct. when somebody is being, when someone's organs are essentially are being kept alive on life support. But so, looking around is in, is interesting right and known as tracking right mm-hmm. like tracking other people's yes. movements yes, and yes, whatnot yes. so it's important to note so the family it's not like the family was sitting by tj's side for days because sure. even though he was there for days it's important to note that this was october of 2021 right so many hospitals still had a lot of covid restrictions okay in place. so so yep. they weren't able to just be by his bedside for days and days and days mm-hmm. and people coming in and out so a lot of his family didn't really all get to gather around him until that honor walk. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they were able to state were there other signs earlier and whatnot, or was this the very first time? Sure. Um, so during most of, most of his time in the hospital, while these decisions were being made in the test, he was mostly alone mm-hmm. outside of the hospital staff. Okay. So there were no family witnesses to all Correct. of these, the physical signs. So his family's interpretation, now his honor walk, was recorded okay. as most can as sure. most are we've all seen you know, videos correct you know of, of <sighs> yes heartbreaking honor yes. walks so, yeah i can't watch them when they're children oh my oh. god that's the those are the ones that so, end up on my fyp all the time and i'm like why why do you yeah <laughs> i can't <sighs> so his family's interpretation of this and seeing it they're like it was almost like he's trying to tell us like like hey guys i'm can still you here stop this? like hey Wow. Um, but they were told and it's on you can hear it on the recording that there's a that there's a provider or a nurse just saying this is a common reflex. I see. Like, okay. And then he, they were also asked to stop recording at that point. Oh, OK. So okay. Um, about an hour after TJ had been brought into surgery for his organs to be retrieved, a doctor came out and explained simply to the family that he wasn't ready. They said that he simply woke up. And his sister recalls getting the, so this is very basic information from the family's recounts. She was simply told that he woke up and she was instructed to bring her brother home, make him comfortable. And that he likely would not live much longer that as far as being organ donated, he doesn't qualify any longer because he did wake up, but his prognosis is still terrible. Like we need to move palliative. Okay. And like I just said earlier, since that day, he went home. She's been caring for him for the past three years, and he does have trouble walking, remembering, and talking, mm-hmm. but he is functioning. Whoa. One of the pictures that I saw, was it looked to be like he was dancing with her sister at her wedding. It, that's what the picture looked like to me. She looked Whoa. like she was in a wedding dress. So 
Okay. That's kind of the families in 2021, like what they remember of it. Got it. And what information they were given, which wasn't a whole lot. Right. They didn't see a whole lot and wasn't given a whole lot. The sister does kind of say that she's like, you know, in my gut, something feels off. You know, something feels yeah. off about it. Like we're going through this and then all of a sudden he just woke up. And then they're again, they're told that he's not going to live. And here he is. And there's been hundreds of providers in his care, rehab, all that stuff throughout the years. Wow. There's been a lot of people involved in his care. Um, it wasn't until January of this year, 2024, that Donna kind of started to learn about behind the scenes. Okay. So here we are. I mean, it's three years from this month yes. when this happened. Yeah. So almost three years went by before Donna really even heard from anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she started to learn. So what happened was a TikTok video was um, seen by one of the former employees that was just like, oh, my God, that hospital looks familiar. This patient looks familiar. Like oh. Those people look familiar. Like, okay. oh, my God, he's alive. Like the staff didn't know after this oh, day what okay. happened to what him. What happened to him? Yeah. They didn't even know his name. I, I wow. learned on something that I was watching that um listening to some to one of the whistleblowers that they often don't even know their name because again the role that they do in healthcare is while beautiful and life-giving to some people you're also taking all the organs out of somebody else and yes. it's very it, it's very traumatizing oh 100 you know and yes. so there's a lot of times that they were saying you read the record but the mm-hmm. name is blanked out you don't need yes. to know the name yep. so you're disconnected a little bit to at mm-hmm. least help some of the employees sure. so um that was part of the reason why it took a little bit too to reach out because yes. they didn't know who they were. He yes. didn't know who he was. And then they never knew what happened to him. So it wasn't until this employee found that video. That video. It just happened to come up and she's like, that environment looks familiar. That hospital looks familiar. Wow. That is the and that's kind of what got this whole thing rolling. So the two the two um employees that are being quote unquote called the whistleblowers mm-hmm. um that have come forward. Um, they're kind of the ones that I'm taking a lot of statements of inside accounts as okay. to what happened. So um, one is Natasha Miller, and she's a former employee of CODA, and she was part of the transplant team that in the OR that day. Okay. Her job was basically to take the or- organs that had been procured, procured and help and to then, transport them. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's Nicoletta Martin, goes by Nikki, and she was also there that day. Um, she, she, well, she was around that day working. She was not in the OR. She oh. read a lot about his case because there was a lot of transplants going on that day Okay, for this hot particular, um, like organization, mm-hmm. that part of the, for that stiff for Kentucky. So <clears throat> she read about his case in preparing herself to have to get drafted in, get, uh-huh. get kind of like on call, get called sure. in. Yep. Um, but she was not in the room that day. So she just has a lot of questions Got and it. information based upon records that she's read. Okay. Whereas Natasha was in the room. Okay. Um, so Nikki Martin, um, Nicoletta, she's the one who reached out to TJ's family um, after seeing that TikTok video. Mm-hmm. Um, she gave insight into them into what happened that day. And she was encouraged by one of her uh, surgeons that she works with. To write a letter to the congressional committee. Oh, wow. And okay. so that's the committee that was held place in September last mm-hmm. month that kind of brought this into headlines. Sure. Yep. Before I get into their statements of what they have to say, I wanted to just kind of go over what an organ donation process is supposed to be like. Okay. Yeah, okay? please do. Um, so it's a little bit lengthy because there's a lot of steps. There are. But um, only an individual can donate organs who has sustained either irreversible cessation of circulatory and respirator functions Mm -hmm. or irreversible cessation cessation excuse me i want to say sensation oh i know of all functions of the entire brain including the brainstem and that that's all dead right a termination of death must be made in accordance with acceptable medical standards in most states it needs to be declared um a brain death by two separate physicians i see okay so and that is the case in kentucky where this took place okay so he was declared brain dead by two physicians correct then. okay the majority of deceased organ donations take place after a physician has declared the death um according to the american academy of neurology brain death is the irreversible loss of clinical function of the brain including the brain stem and is a legal declaration of death 
Right. Like, there's like no hope of recovery. Correct. Like this is like Absolutely you've lost. None. You are never going to have any meaningful awareness. Nothing. Or participation in your own life. Correct. After brain death. You can't even breathe on your own. Right. You can't even do the basic right. bodily function right. of breathing. Excuse me. Um, it's not a subjective decision by a physician. It's very objective. The patient yes. has to undergo numerous tests to confirm an irreversible loss of brain function and to support the pronouncement. Usually the brain dead patient has suffered a brain injury resulting from trauma, oxygen deprivation, or stroke. The person's heart is kept beating by mechanical ventilation, mm -hmm. and that keeps the blood and oxygen flowing to their organs, keeping right. them viable. As a result, this person could very well much look alive despite having suffered an irreversible loss of brain function. And it can be confusing to loved ones. Um, and that's why it's very essential for physicians to have to explain the clinical certainty. Right. Of, and it really kind of dumb it down to mm -hmm. this is the test. This is what you're supposed to do. And this is what his brain is not doing. Right. Um, to help the families accept that they really aren't coming back. Right. Even though their heart is beating their lungs are breathing with the help of a machine. Right. They are not coming back. Right, right, right. There is donation after cardiac death, mm -hmm. which was TJ's prognosis. Okay. This was his um, because he had suffered cardiac arrest for 35 minutes. Right. Anyone whose brain function has been determined to be incompatible with life but does not meet all criteria for brain death is a potential candidate for a donation after cardiac death, okay. which is known as DCD. Okay. DCD may be presented as an option to families when they have accepted that their loved ones cannot survive and have made the decision to remove the person from life support. If the family chooses the DCD, the person will be taken off the ventilator in an operating room. When their heart stops beating, a physician declares death and organs are recovered. These patients are given approximately about 90 minutes after extubation to pass on their own. I see. And okay. it's very common practice to give them palliative medications during those 90 minutes mm -hmm. too so that it's yep. peaceful sure this is the original method of managing organ donation um, and it has increased donations by as much as 25 percent currently um, to this day it is only about 14 percent of the life-saving donations okay. um, is the donation after cardiac death i see okay um, donor referral so donors potential donors are referred to the organ donation mm -hmm. system so hospitals are required, this was interesting, hospitals are required to report, to report each death or imminent death. State legislation known as PA Act blah, 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 mm -hmm. 102 of 1994 served as the template for the federal initiative, making the proce referral process a nationwide requirement. And I know, I remember this from... I wanted your input a little bit on this because you obviously yeah. with the hospital. Yeah. So give me your input. See with you know, kind of after I read this. Mm -hmm. So um, in Western Pennsylvania, most of West Virginia, a county in New York, hospital staff will notify CORE. CORE then reviews the potential donor's medical condition and history to determine what gifts he or she would be able to donate. Mm -hmm. um, CORE is just for that area, the organ donation agency. Mm -hmm. um, for TJ's case, it was CODA, which is Kentucky Organ Donation Association. Gotcha. So for TJ's case, CODA was notified that TJ was at the hospital and a potential organ donor before the family even was. Because, that's not uncommon, I don't right, think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I wanted your insight a little yes. bit. Um, is so like for this, for the as one of the the employees were stating for the state of Kentucky where TJ was, when a patient meets certain triggers, one of them being the the GCS, the Glasgow Coma mm -hmm. Scale, yep. un is under six, or the family starting to talk about next steps, a nurse is required to call CODA yes. automatically. Yes. Even though the family might not even know that right. the discussion of organ donation is happening. Right. Um, so you've kind of seen something yeah, like that? So, um, I and thought you might have when I was researching. here, it's, um, what is it, New England, Organ, New England Organ Bank, I think? Potentially. And it's um, it was a requirement for um, anybody who, like you said, meets certain clinical criteria mm -hmm. like like that gcs or you know other similar things like their prognosis is poor that nursing would be required to refer them to the organ bank which does not necessarily mean they are going to die and it does not necessarily mean that they are going to donate their organs it's just like a notification to the organ mm -hmm. bank 
here's hey, a potential. Here's the demographics of this person. Mm -hmm. And that way they can know like, hey, is this person on the registry? And if they're on the registry, mm -hmm. like, and they do decline, we can continue with our, right. with our right. referral it process. It kind of gets the ball rolling a little bit. Exactly. Um, so if the person is a candidate for organ donation, one of the organ procurement coordinators will review the medical chart at the hospital and, if appropriate, speak with the potential donors next of kin. When there's a potential for tissue donation, a donor referral coordinator will call the potential donor's family to discuss the donation options. So when they're like looking like, okay, you actually might start to meet criteria, yes. this is where we're going to talk to the family. Yep. The donor goes through lots of evaluation. There's a whole process. Um, information is provided about the potential donor's medical status and past medical history. The evaluation includes a medical and social history and physical examination. Um, this will even determine if they're suitable to donate. Well, that's the thing. And I think that's why a lot of times the families aren't notified on that initial referral is they because don't even know. it's almost like eight or nine times out of 10, they it's will not meet correct, criteria. Because correct. It is pretty low when it's I was very listening. low. Yeah. yeah. So it's like you refer them to see if they're on the registry and if they would even meet criteria. And mm -hmm. it's like, they're not even going to reach out to the family unless they've confirmed, yes, they're on the registry. Right. And yes, this is somebody who we could potentially harvest right. gifts from. Yep. And then, okay, we, we do need to talk to the family yep. at this point. But again, it's, you know, a lot of people do not meet that. It's very stringent criteria and a lot of and people don't meet that. And that was one of that. the things that the two staff members were talking about. Because, like, some of the folks on the podcast were pretty alarmed by it. And so was I initially. Because I'm like, I, for me, in my, in what I work in, you talk to the family before you do anything. Sure. But. I guess I can see where this is coming from. And yeah. it, and the girls were saying that it is very common practice. Right, that that's exactly. part of protocols for their wanna, state specifically. Exactly. So. You don't want to like, you know, get a family member all riled up when if they're, you don't know. When, if you just don't know, first of all, if this person's even going to continue to decline and if they're going to pass and what that plan is mm -hmm. and B, like why even pose that question unless we know that this is somebody who is on the registry and meets those very strict criteria. Correct. Um, so if their medical history does not rule out donation, then they begin the pro process of working with the hospital to determine the appropriate time to approach the, the next of kin. If a donor designation or individual authorization by the potential donor cannot be identified, the family must give their authorization in order for the donation process to proceed. So that if they're not sense. on the registry and whatnot. Mm -hmm. If they're authorized do donation, the next of kin signs an authorization form. They've been, um... They authorize and then they've been provided um, all of the donor designation stuff. The um, the coordinator, um, in conjunction with the hospital staff, maintain the donor medically. They try to keep them stable. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, in, in some cases, they have to get other physicians in to support um, to just kind of keep organs viable, mm -hmm. essentially. They place the organs, um, so they, we, we all probably basic know this, that they um, do the donor's blood type. Um, the, body, the blood yes. type and the body size is provided to UNOS, the United Network for Organ Sharing, uh, by the OPO, which is the Organ Procurement Organization. Sure. The, the UNOS computer will match the donated organs to potential recipients. It's based upon blood type, body size, medical urgency, and length of time on the waiting list. Um, when they uh, are matching the pancreas and the kid kidneys, they also look at genetic tissue type. Right. Yeah, I've read yeah. that. Yep. A computerized list of waiting patients is provided to the coordinator who seeks to match the organs with recipients in the current donation service area. Mm -hmm. So, like, they try to keep it locally if they can, if there's somebody waiting that's a match. Sure. If a match cannot be made, then they'll look uh, within that area. Then they'll look for um, the next regional basis and then go nationally mm -hmm. if necessary. Because nationally, too, adds a lot. Like time is of the essence when you start harvesting organs and mm -hmm. whatnot. So you need the recipients team to get there yes. and, and things like that. So they try to do local based on the list mm -hmm. and all that stuff and then branch out. If a recipient has been match has been found. They'll get a message out to the transplant center and then they work on getting um, the the transplant surgeon. They're responsible for making the decision whether they'll accept it. Right. You know, because then sometimes is there a risk? Do they want this one? Do they not? Yes. Um, and then they will um, if they the, some surgeons will decline that organ for a patient and then the, the coordinator will simply just go to the next person on the sure. list. Yep. Um, until and they do this for each organ until there's been a recipient for each one. 
Um, the coordinator will then arrange for the operating room for the recovery of the organs and the arrival and departure times of the plants transplant surgery teams. There's and this so is a much. lot of moving parts because this is let's so say many moving parts. Let's say someone, you know, unfortunately has to be an organ donor, but yeah. has made that life giving decision. Mm -hmm. You could have a heart going to one patient, their lungs going to another, oh, their yeah. kidneys going to somebody yeah, their else, their eyes going to somewhere their else, their liver They're, going to, yes, you know, like, yes. and so you could have a half a dozen different surgery teams mm -hmm. waiting for that organ, mm -hmm. all from the one surgery team that's doing the harvesting. Yes. So there's a lot of moving parts that have to happen with one patient. You with really one don't think about, you know, the end user, right. I guess. Right. You know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. users, I should say. Right. Uh, but it's it is wild to think about all of the coordination and behind mm -hmm. the scenes stuff that goes on. So once all of the transplant surgery teams arrive, the donors taken to the operating room where the organs and tissues are recovered through a dignified surgical procedure. In accordance with federal laws, transplant surgeons recover the organs. Um, they, the transplant surgeons don't actually participate in the donor's care prior to the determination of brain dead. Right. The transplant surgeon is just simply there for the transplant. Yes. That way that there's no like, there's no overlap ethical questioning and, ethical, and, and whatnot. Yes. So they're separate. Their sole job is the transplant. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, the lengthy breakdown of what is supposed to happen for those that don't fully understand it and, and whatnot. And I've never worked in organ donation, obviously. I've never yeah. even in my in my field, um, that's not something we would consider. They're not acutely mm -hmm. ill. They're chronically right, ill, right, right. right, in long-term care. Yeah. But for you who had the acute care experience, seeing yeah. more of that trauma-related stuff, I mm -hmm. had a feeling that you at least kind of yeah. knew s similar basics of the process. And I also did participate in one organ procurement well, I did my brief stint in the oh, OR. Oh, my goodness. Tell me um, about that. And I didn't, why did I not know this? I don't know. Wow. <laughs> Learning so much about you today. I know, right? My God. I feel like this All would have been a day. Are coming I feel out like of the this closet. would have been a day we discussed. I know. Other so, than I know that you hated the OR. That's what I remember. Yeah, I was not I was not a uh, OR girly. And um if you I mean, we have a lot of listeners who work in the OR mm -hmm. and I love you guys. It just it was not for me. It's not for a lot of people. I found mm -hmm. out the hard way. It was definitely not for me. Mm -hmm. I did um get the opportunity to participate in an organ procurement, just one while I was there. Um, wow. It was definitely an interesting experience. Um, I uh, the one thing that really surprised me, uh, and but actually made a lot of sense, was that they administered full anesthesia to this person mm -hmm. um, because, and it, the way it was explained to me was that we just don't know like what these people can feel and what they can't feel. Um, yeah, I'll explain that a little bit. Good. Yeah, oh, yes, good. Okay. Bit, yeah. um, so I thought that was like sort of the most interesting piece is that That's there was an part of the anesthesia pain. Part, right? Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just making sure that, you know, even though we don't know and like maybe they can't feel, they probably can't feel, but like we don't know. So we're just mm -hmm. going to make sure it's comfortable. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the whole thing was um, actually, you know, it was quick. It was dignified. You know, everybody was just like did quiet they, how and many, respectful. Did, how many organs did they do? So they did eyes. They did um, they did abdominal organs, but no thoracic organs. Okay. I don't know if there was some diagnosis Reason that why. precluded that, right. but they did um, liver, pancreas, kidneys, uh, adrenals. I don't know if that's a transplant organ or not. I don't okay. think so, actually. Um, and... Uh, but they did not do any like cardiopulmonary. Didn't stuff. do the heart or lungs. Nope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. So now that we've kind of talked about the process of donation, I kind of want to really kind of dive into what the two employees have to say that yes. have come forward. Okay. Oh, yes. So all of kind of the next following stuff is really from them. And like I said, everything is alleged. These girls are very brave for coming forward. 100%. One of them's facing multitude of retaliation. Oh, wow. Um, okay. You know, fired from jobs and whatnot. But, you know, she just definitely feels like it's the right thing to do. 100%. And yeah. there's a lot of, um, I will preface too, before we get into the shocking things, is there's a lot of worry. Like, mm -hmm. Are people going to change their donation status? Oh, or, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like this, no, like, that's the fallout. And is there going to, yeah. right. And like what the worry is and whatnot. And, and some people are, and I don't think I disagree with this, especially kind of delving into it without even knowing what's confirmed and not confirmed and what the truth is. But mm -hmm. I'll get a little bit into it. I'm an organ donor. Me too. And I want to donate my organs. Me too. 
in the event that I can. Do I decide down the line that I just let my family know those wishes and not be on the registry? Right. Yeah. That's a possibility. Yeah, sure. You know, sure. the next time I renew my license, I'm going to think a little bit more harder by checking wow. that box. Okay. Um, it does make me think a little bit more hmm. about that. Um, you can be a donor without being on the registry. 100%. Yeah. So you can. You can. It, you know, I, I think we might see less names on the registry potentially while some mm. reform is going into place, you know, okay. which if these are true mm-hmm. and they're no longer alleged, reform needs to happen. Right. You know, mm-hmm. and yeah. and I would not blame people for coming off the registry. Wow. But maybe wanting to then let the family decide when it's all said and done. Sure. And yeah. there's not like a vulture coming for me yeah that, yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, no, that seems like rude that, to say but no but that like that's the sensation right, right? that's the worry right. and that's yeah. the fear mm-hmm. is that are they just going to start coming for me and i'm not really gone oh that's so, so unsettling and uncomfy and just ugh. yes okay. um so like i said as i get to the the stuff that's really alarming mm. um we don't know the full truth yet right so i can't say that enough um so um, like I had mentioned previously, Nikki Martin was not assigned to the operating room that day, but she thought she might get drafted into there. So she started reviewing his case from earlier in the day. She initially became alarmed when she read that the donor showed signs of life when doctor tried to examine his heart. Oh, um, so he had had a cardiac catheterization. Right. See what kind of what his heart viability sure. was and yep. whatnot um, at 9 a.m. that morning. Okay. According to the medical records, based upon Nikki Martin, TJ had woken up during his procedure that morning <gasps> of his cardiac catheterization, and what? he was thrashing around on the table. Oh, oh, okay. So the cardiac cath is performed through a major artery and is performed um, on potential donors to evaluate whether their heart is healthy enough to yes. go to a person in need of a new heart. Yeah. Um, Nikki says that doctor sedated him when he woke up. And plans to recover his organs continued to proceed. That's really interesting. So the family had not been informed about what happened oh, during the cardiac cath. They didn't, they didn't get so informed? So that was at 9 o'clock that morning. His honor walk was at 6 o'clock that same day at night. So <sighs> nine hours had gone by and they were never told that he was like thrashing. And um, I think I wrote here that he... Um, Went to try to like almost like grab the surgeon, the person who was doing or the doc, the oh. provider that was doing the cath. I mean, because so had they known, everything would have stopped at this point. Everything would had the family sure. known like, oh, TJ started thrashing around. We're wondering if he's waking up. Everything would have stopped. Of course, right? That I makes sense. I also know to play devil's so. advocate mm-hmm. that there is a certain amount, like we were saying before, with the eye tracking mm-hmm. and the eye movement. That there is a certain amount of involuntary movement Correct. that is expected Correct. in that state. Yep. And that is yep. very normal in that state. Correct. So it very well may have been within that realm of normality that I we're used to big, seeing. I think the big question here is what didn't happen. Yes. Is that those things started to happen. Right. But no further testing was done to determine if it was voluntary or involuntary. If something had changed that we know with of right his now. brain activity. Yeah. Right. According to the two people that have come forward. Gotcha. Everything did not stop and get reevaluated to find out was that voluntary or involuntary. Got it. That's, okay. the, big that's the big piece that's concern. missing. Um, so mm-hmm. Natasha Miller, who was the employee that was in the OR that day, stated that when she walked into the OR, it was clear that TJ was erroneously declared dead. Oh, okay. She said her job was to get to the OR early to help start setting up and form the team. Mm -hmm. And when she went in, things were already pretty chaotic. Staff members were already aware of the case, and a lot of staff were upset that they were proceeding with the case. This is how she walks in. She had not been part of the case prior. She goes in to do her job because her job is to just transport organs. And make sure that those are handled safely and get ready to be delivered to a recipient. And she's seeing that other staff members she are like, seeing, why are we harvesting this man's saying, organs? I can't believe you're doing this. I can't believe you're in here. And it, she's coming into this this chaotic scene. I feel like this is a moment where if anybody in the room has a, has a reason why we should not harvest this man's organs like right wedding? now. Yes. Like a wedding. Does anyone here believe that Please we should not move your forward fucking with hand this? And we should yeah. stop everything until everybody is satisfied. Right. 
have all questions been answered? Yes. Yeah. Um, so she stated that the, that other staff were upset. Her recollection of TJ when he wheeled into the OR was that he was thrashing and moving around way more than a normal patient. Whoa. Okay. He had tears rolling down <gasps> his eyes. Oh, my God. Really? And straps were used on him to prevent him from pulling out his tube. His intubation tube. He was restrained? He was restrained. And he had tears rolling down his eyes. This is so unsettling and one of the things that, that was striking very odd during all of this is that now i fully believe that people can hear you and whatnot and like you should yes. explain things but again in this kind of situation it's not normal for a patient to be explained everything that is about to happen to them right yeah right because right. they're supposed to be brain dead i mean in theory know, in theory sure so, but however, TJ was being explained the procedure as things were happening. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take you from the ICU bed to the operating table. We're going to move you. Wow. Thankfully, the declaring physician, the physician who was supposed to declare him after he was extubated, um, walked in and said she was not comfortable with proceeding with the case because of how neurologically aware he was. Wow. Phew. Okay. Um, I mean, Yes. Like the, that, that's the bare minimum. Correct. <laughs> yes. I guess the transplant surgeon also, well, again, was not prior involved prior to extubation. Saw him and was like, what said, the fuck are we the, doing? And the words were, I'm out. Yep. From, the, from the transplant Good. surgeon. Good. I'm out. The case coordinator from CODA, um, she called her supervisor because for her, this was a very rare situation. She called her supervisor and she basically said, um, listen, I, I can't get anyone to declare this patient. Like, no one's moving forward because no one's declaring. Now, the whis Natasha states she did not hear what was said on the other side of the phone. Okay. She's like, I, I was not on the phone call. Right. All I yeah, know is what she know. was saying on the other side. But she said, based on what the coordinator was having to respond to, it was pretty apparent that the CODA coordinator was told to basically find someone else to do it. No. Find someone else to declare him. No. I, guess I don't want to think this about organ banks. Right. Like, I don't want that to be my concern about an organ bank. Right. What the fuck? Are you so, serious? I guess the coordinator, <sighs> you know, the coordinator's in the room. She's in the OR talking to her supervisor. Who knows where they are? Um, but the coordinator was crying. I am not okay. Her supervisor is telling her to do this. You need to find someone else. And this man is fucking and alive. She's in a room with this patient who's got tears rolling down his eyes because he's probably scared as hell of why am i in here what are they doing to me and you've got physicians going sorry hell no not doing this what the um, fuck this was the point that the case was shut down uh -huh. when there was no one to declare because yeah. nobody was moving forward yep if this is true that like i said the fact that he woke up after the cath and everything it, it should have never gotten to this point no. tj should have never been in the or and that i guess is what a lot of the hospital staff allegedly are upset about is the fact that it was documented in his record that i'm going to mention all of these things that his prognosis had been improving all of this stuff everybody at that hospital felt like he should not be going to that or wow and they still and do he it went on anyway walks. so <sighs> Like I said, Natasha, she initially became concerned when she was reviewing the chart. She read in his chart that earlier in the AM, there was documentation for providers that his condition was improving. The coordinator had also documented that physic physicians believed he shouldn't be going to the OR. Yet he wound up there anyway. I, I don't understand how, with all of these concerns, he ended up in, in that mm -hmm. room. So, um, in the medical record, it is charted. That when TJ was getting his cardiac cath, he was trying to push the doctor's hand. So not just thrashing, he was trying to push like the hand. Like with intent. Yes. Like, get the fuck away from and me. And then that's when the physician, that physician was like, whoa, he okay. was quite alarmed. He did not understand why he was given such a grave prognosis. Huh. It's also charted that the hospital staff were calling it euthanasia due to TJ, TJ after the cardiac cath was given rocky ronium, versed, and fentanyl. Now, like you said... Those are fully anesthesia meds. Yes. Like, so that's not uncommon to yes. be done post extubation and whatnot mm -hmm. with all of that. However, he's given them after the cardiac cath, 
He's not even like fully at the extubation, like in the OR. Like he was sedated, like and actively then sedated. After and that. then continuing, this was after he'd been reaching up to the physician. The palliative meds, um, sorry, I just said are given there. Wipeout. The problem here is that it's also charted that they plan on giving him more of those meds. Like they plan to sedate him even further. So they had ordered like more doses of these sedating meds until his procurement is what you're saying. Basically. Because yes. they they were aware that he was thrashing yeah, and, and so they're fighting feeling like and uncomfortable. The 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 um alleging claim is that they are needing to sedate, sedate him even further to get to that point. And is no one realizing how abnormal this is? Or is people are just hoping, like saying, well, he's already been declared brain dead. I'm not going to fight that. Again, no one is willing to speak to that yet because they're <sighs> not in a courtroom. This is so bizarre. But there's a lot of like, I can't. How did the whistleblower state it? She's like, I can't legally speak to someone else's right, whatever. Because there's arbitration right. going on. So at this point, after the cath, this was the biggest part. Like I said, he was never offered a repeat nerve exam right, after right, right. this. Wow. And it was charted that they planned to give him more of the meds. And of course, they're going to depress his respiratory system, making him look even more like he's got a depressed system. He's brain dead. He's whatever. So Nikki, she again was not in the room. She just read through his case files and everything and was mm -hmm. a part of it, but not in the room. A week after this event of TJ and everything coming to a halt, she quit from CODA. Her reasoning, she said that um, they originally did like a debriefing mm -hmm. after, right? And and as they should, a lot of people do that with like what could have gone better, all this sure. stuff. She said it's kind of started with an are you okay debriefing? How okay. are you doing with all of this? What's going on? The words in the debriefing towards the end, it ended in... If you open that chart, if you talk about the case, you will be fired. Whoa. Correct. So this has gone from a debriefing to a, we are shutting this shit down. Don't tell down. anybody. We are yeah. going to sweep it under the rug. Correct. In true giant hospital fashion. Correct. Fuck. Um, this, is, this is, this is real messed up. It's important to note um, that... <sighs> His bedside exam. So the exams that are done to determine the death, right? The exam that is done is the uh, a bedside exam, an apnea test, and a swallow study. Like, okay. Those are not in his medical record. Hold on. What? At the moment, his electronic medical record and what's in paper form, those cannot be found. So the tests that require that are required for a brain death diagnosis, correct, are not present in his medical record, but yet he was given this diagnosis of brain death. He was now remember no one made the final declaration, but right, okay, they yeah. needed all of those to do that, and those should have been in place before getting to the OR. Why? 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 So Any those of this, why? so those objective tests were not in place. Before they did the cardiac cath, before they did the honor walk. Okay. This is before they, and I will say allegedly not in place. Because we don't know for it's sure. It's just yet. at this point in time, what has been read in the electronic chart and in the paper chart, those documents have been yet to be seen. This is getting weirder and darker yeah. and creepier. Now, again, I, I briefly touched upon this a little bit, but there is a, you know, so there's worry about the fallout. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? Not so much with like this TG case, but like for the future. Reform, if all of this is true, clearly needs to change. Yep. And that it clearly needs to happen. But I, and I do agree. I think there needs to be a little bit more education for informed consent. Yes. When you get your driver's license and you check that box. Yes. Because right now it's just a, do you want to be an organ donor? And you check the box. And nobody had like, mostly people have no idea like what, what the behind the scenes stuff and like that there is a registry well, and all of that. Like no one, um, 16 year olds that are getting their license. Yeah. They're not even of the age of consent for themselves. Yeah. You know, they're a minor, but they're going to check that box. We're not like discouraging they, anybody from checking the box. I am not. If you want to check the box, check the box. All if you want to be an organ donor, check the all box. All this has done for me is just made me question it a little bit. Like, right. how do I want to be an organ donor? Exactly. Do I want to be a donor on the registry? Do right. I want to let my family Right. Make decide. that decide. Make that decision I am for not me. swaying people one way or another, but I do agree 
that part of this reform, if and when it gets there, if all of this is found to be true, I do agree that we need to inform people a little bit. Agreed. I mean, Christ, you get a vaccine and you're given a whole page like a and novel. a half of a VIS yeah. sheet, information yes. sheet. Yes, exactly. You should be given a, you check that box, here's the sheet on what's that, yeah. what that here's means. The, here's what that means. On how it works. Yep. And what say we have versus what your family has. Yes, exactly. So, so because one of the, one of the things that I learned through a little, with this investigation is that that being on the registry, if push comes to shove and the family doesn't want to proceed, if you're on that registry, at least for Kentucky, that I learned on this, it can be a legal binding document. Oh. And the OPO, the Oregon Procurement Organization, they do have the right to go get um to get a court document to retrieve those organs Whoa. because it's on the registry. Okay. okay. That's what makes it a little like hmm. Well, so well, again, please don't make any decisions about what you decide to do based upon my opinion oh, here. Hell no. we're or in anything. A, we're, we're in a, a basement of under in a, a heated basement. Throw, yes. Like it's very children easy. playing upstairs. We're just we're just talking and we're, we're in theory. Vibing. A lot yeah. of this is just like what? But this is really raising for me like I was I have never been someone who's like a conspiracy theorist about no. organ donation and who's like, don't check the box or like the Correct. EMTs won't save you if they Correct. see it on your license. Yes. That's not true. And you that's guys. not me either. But if there's going to be some fucking big wig on the phone pushing a bedside crew to be like, you better find someone to declare this person brain dead so that we can get those organs. Right. I am very uncomfortable with that. Right. Like, and, I gotta go. And so part of that comes from one of the questions being raised. Again, I don't have facts and figures. But one of the questions that's being raised is, is that there are apparently, for organ donation, organ procurement organizations like CODA, there are certain metrics that they have to maintain. Oh, of course. To keep CMS funding. So they're trying but to meet those. But in this case, like metrics slash quota, mm -hmm. you know, like, and so I don't know what these numbers are. I've seen nothing, you know, concrete and whatnot, but they get their compensation and reimbursement and keep their government funding when they meet these metrics. So even if the organ and this happens, even if organs are donated for research and can't be donated to another person. I do not understand how this man made it to the OR with all with all of this. Yes, I know. I mean, I know that's the entire question. I just even one of the whistleblowers is, is saying that um, at CODA, she has said she's seen it. There is a deep freezer at the CODA headquarters. No. Where there are kidneys and pancreases no, where they not. were taken from a donor. Her example was somebody that uh, one of the physicians was saying on a on a person that had kidney failure, like this person's creatinine was super high, well, like whatever. And so then they're saying like this patient needs a kidney. Why are we harvesting their kidney? You know. Oh. And so again, they can meet their metrics even by donating for research. That. So like, are they? taking organs that they don't necessarily need just to meet figures all of this is alleged what? but she has said there it's is a going. freezer in that building with what? tags of who they came from what the fuck and what is going on Devin? i hate this so do i this is <laughs> so do i this is so fucked up so nikki miller Oh. Wrote in her, so she was the one who, like I said, wrote a, a congressional letter. In her letter, it says, What is clear to me from my time at CODA is that the organ procurement organization does not operate in patients' interests and regularly engages in unethical activities for the sole purpose of trying to keep its lucrative government contract. That's what she wrote to the committee. I want to just say, I, Yep, go yeah, ahead. That I, that I think. <sighs> This is this is so disheartening. I don't know what to think either. Um, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I, I interrupted you and then lost my train of thought. I think it's also important here for me to read Coda's statement on the incident. Okay, Coda. Okay. Fucking go for it. The safety of our patients is always our highest priority. I'm sure it is. <laughs> Fuck you. Sorry. Anyway, coming. continue. We work closely with our patients and their families to ensure our patients' wishes for organ donation are followed. 
No one at CODA has ever been pressured to collect organs from any living patient. According to the statement from Julie Bergen, President and Chief Operating Officer for Network for Hope, which was formed when CODA merged. CODA does not recover organs from living patients, and CODA has never pressured its team members to do so. Are we sure? I don't know. Because, again, it's still... It's alleged. That is alleged. Um, so one of the things, there's a still a lot of unanswered questions. One of the big things that this shocked me, because everything that I read, everything, that, and again, it's just media articles. There's not court documents now. I'm not, I, I don't have mm-hmm. access to the medical records. They're all an investigation. Like, we, we are not seeing any of that. Nothing official. It's mostly media stuff right now. But one of the big things that is coming from a red flag from his family's perspective is they believe that the drug overdose was an automatic assumption. Oh. It was in his medical record okay. that he has a history of IV drug use. According to his sister, um, according to his sister, the medical record states that he was loading items into his car and then collapsed and had a heart attack. His sister states that he is adamantly afraid of needles. Anytime he would go to the doctors, it would take four people to hold him down to do blood draws. Anything okay. with needles. He had, she said that he used to work in a factory and he had chemical burns to his right foot after working in a factory. Some of the chemicals would get into his boots and whatever. Yep. yep. <laughs> and he would get chronic athlete's foot that led to sores and scars. Mm-hmm. And she said that this was made assumptions that it was track marks on his feet. Again, so I don't someone... know. But according to his sister, according to his sister, who's currently caring for him today, mm-hmm. she is adamant that he was not an IV drug user. Okay. So he may so, not have been an IV drug user. There's also other ways to ingest the, drugs. Yes. Yes. However, this is just, that's valid. This is just them being like. I mean, he must have there, tested was positive there, for something. That, correct. That's what I said. I'm like, I haven't seen medical records. What right. is the talk show? What is all that? So she's just like, no. He, he, it was not a drug overdose. And so then, cause then mm. there was like this, like, and I think that that part came about when it was like, people were thinking, did they just think that because this was a drug overdose, his life didn't matter. If he well, didn't right. treat his body well, why can't we just give these organs to somebody else who will care? You know, like there was <sighs> a lot so of that, which is terrible to think. And 100%. I would never think that no, way. No, of course Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So whether that was true or not, I don't know. We'll, when, whenever this gets to court, I'm sure there's going to be the whole, I'd say, cause of death, but he's not dead. He's alive. I'm sure talk screen results will come out. I'm, I'm sure all of that. And I would like to know how many more people that were not really brain dead ended up having their fucking or- organs harvested. I hope. I hope more people don't come none. forward with horror stories like this. Correct. With hospital employees. And organ bank mm-hmm. employees that were not brave enough to speak up mm-hmm. and raise a concern and just went along with it. Mm-hmm. That's what I that's what I think. Um, I just kind of wanted to end with TJ a little bit. Yeah. yeah so yeah. he is. Well, he lives with his sister. Like I said, mm-hmm. one of the sad things is that he is dealing with survivor's guilt. Oh, he really has this TJ. like he, his memory. His sister said the further it gets away, the less he remembers, which is great. For you know, because she's like, I don't want him to remember oh, this, but yeah. he still does remember. He doesn't remember a lot of the details of things, but he does remember that fear mm-hmm. that he had. Um, and he has a lot of this, like, why didn't I just die so that all these other good people could oh, live? Oh, the poor um, guy. So many people that day thought they were going to live because of me, but I didn't die. Oh, Jesus, the poor um, guy. So, and the that was guy. crushing. I mean, he's gone through this horrifying event. This that uh, is completely unimaginable. And he's just like, why, 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 didn't why me and not them? Yes. Oh, um, and I do think we should. Um, so there is a TikTok on social media um, that has videos of him and how he's doing with his life. Oh, yeah. I because a lot know. of the providers and people that cared for him wanted to know how he was doing after mm-hmm. all of this. Oh. Um, and so they were interested in his story, which, again, is the same TikTok that got um, Nikki mm-hmm. alerted to. Oh, my God, that's him. Wow. And he survived. I'll find it and I'll put it in the show notes. I'll link mm-hmm. it. Wow. I'll give you the name of what they said. Okay. So 
that is that. Oh, my God. Well, I'm very uncomfortable. Thank I you for that. I think we are going to need a follow-up episode. Mm-hmm. I don't know how long it will take. It might take till season five for us to even have any more updates because wow. yeah, they are investigating. There's no actual charges yet. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think it's going to take quite some time. Wow. Um, Like I said, the family only got wind of this not even a full year ago. Mm-hmm. Um. And they just had the congressional hearing and who knows what's going to happen. Right. Who knows? Um, so it could be quite some time before we have any real answers mm-hmm. and what's going to change, if anything. So. That is crazy. That is so uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm like so sad to know that this happened. Correct. On Like for so many different reasons. Mm-hmm. I'm sad for those employees that had to witness that. I'm yep. sad for the family that had to go through the insane roller coaster that that must have been. Mm-hmm. Yep. I'm sad for TJ. For sure. For sure. For sure. Poor guy. Thank you for listening, everybody. Yes. If you want to keep following us, you can check us out on Facebook at Med Crimes Podcast. You can find us on YouTube, Med Crimes Podcast. You can search us on Instagram at Med Crimes Podcast. If you want to become a Patreon, you can find us at www.patreon.com slash Med Crimes Podcast. And you get 10% off merch if you're a Patreon member. So you can send us your crazy stories, comments, suggestions, or anything you want talked about on Break Room Banter. Because we are coming up to the end of season three. What? I believe our next episode in two weeks from this will be mid-November. Yep. And after that, we will not be back till January. That's right. So break room banter episode coming up to close out the season. Yes. So with that, we'll see you in two weeks. We will. Love you. Stay safe out there. Bye-bye.